seated. If you have your Bibles with you and you want to follow along, we're going to read from Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. And once you're there, I'm going to invite you to turn your eyes up to the screen. I want us to found this written by James Montgomery in 1818. It's entitled, Prayer is the Soul's Supreme Desire. And since we're in the midst of a series on the great prayers of the Bible, I thought we would read his, his expression here uh, responsibly. It's not so much a prayer as it is an acknowledgement. So once I see all eyes here, we'll do that. And, and we'll do that. Okay, let us responsibly read this together. Prayer is the soul's supreme desire expressed in thought or word. The burning, the burning of a hidden fire, fire and longing for the Lord. Prayer is the simplest sound we teach when children learn God's name. And yet it is the noble speech that you lips can pray. Prayer is the secret battleground where victories are won. By prayer, the will of God is found. Begun. Prayer is the Christian's vital breath, the Christian's native air. Our watchword at the gates of death, we enter heaven with prayer. Prayer is the church's glorious song, our task and joy supreme. We name our Lord in every tongue, and praise is all our being. Jesus, by whom we come to God, the true and living way. The humble path of prayer and trod, Lord, teach us how to pray. So one of the great prayers of the Bible is here in Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. And we'll talk a little bit about it after I read it, setting the tone for it. But picking up, it says in verse 5, And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ears be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you, and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the Father's part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, I pray, please, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servant to desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Now, as Nehemiah is setting the stage here for this great prayer, there are some things that came before the words. I don't know if you realize that when you pray, there are some things that we might want to think about doing before just kind of going blah all over the place and spewing out whatever comes out of our mouths. And so what makes this a great prayer begins with how Nehemiah prepares himself. And so I just want to look at verse uh, number four as a starting point. So it was when I heard these words, and we'll come to the, what those words were in a few moments that I sat down and wept, and I mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So before you can pray any great prayer of success, we might want to start with a sense of humility and brokenness. That's really what came before this great prayer. Nehemiah hears about the brokenness of the walls of Jerusalem. And you know how we would be. We'd get busy right away. We'd start doing something about the walls. Nehemiah begins by searching out God. He wept over the condition 
of the walls and of the people. Remember in the prayer, which we'll look at, that, that he, he reminds God that God said that if they're faithful, he'd bring them back from all the places that he scattered them. Well, the people are scattered here. And they're coming back to a city that lay in ruins. And as they begin to come back, Nehemiah starts to strategize in his mind a plan. But before he carried out that plan, he fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And so this sets the tone for his work. Anything that we do for the sake of the kingdom needs to be kind of brought forth in the same way, in a spirit of humility and brokenness and seeking the face of God before we begin the work. Because it sets the tone for the work and the prayer that's to fall. Too many times we're busy about, you know how we are, right? God called us to be his children. We use the word we're human beings, but most of us live as if we're human doings. And so we get busy all the time because if we're not doing something, we must be doing nothing. Stands to reason, right? But before Nehemiah did anything, he sat down before the Lord of heaven and he sought his face with weeping, fasting, mourning, and prayer. And before we look specifically at the, the, the particulars of the contents of the prayer, I want to give you a quick outline here of the four apostolic principles that Nehemiah contains just in chapter 1 for this great work of restoration. So, the reason I wanted to look at this is because it really kind of applies to the church here. This is a church that is in need of restoration, and so we can glean some things from Nehemiah in chapter 1. Now, the rest of the book is an awesome book as well. It contains a lot more even apostolic principles and, and things that we can look at, but we're just going to contain ourselves to these verses in this chapter. The first thing Nehemiah did was contained in verses 1 through 3. The word of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah, it came to pass in the month of Chislev in the 20th year, as I was in Sushan, the citadel, that Hananiah, one of my, bro Hanani, one of my brothers, came uh, with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who left from the captivity in the providence are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. The first thing Nehemiah did was he assessed the true condition of his people and of his nation. You know, psychology has a word for to do other than this and it's called denial. To live in denial does us absolutely no good going forward. In order to go forward, we need to evaluate where we're at in true condition and say, here's what, in this case, something has to be different. Because the people, it says, were in distress and reproach. The wall was broken down and the gates were burned with fire. Nehemiah used the gift of apostolic leadership to become self-aware and make others aware of their true condition. Without knowing the truth, there can never be a path to true freedom. If we just say, ah, everything's okay, it's not so bad, we're never going to move off of that place and we'll remain in the ruins, in distress and in reproach. That's the first thing. He assessed the true condition of his people and of the nation. The second thing that happens here is that he was moved inwardly and he received a compelling vision to meet God. See, when he heard about the true condition, that they were in distress and reproach and the walls had been broken down and the gates had been burned and that the, 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 the people were just hurting and the city was in ruin, he didn't go, ah, but at least I'm okay. He didn't say, eh, maybe somebody will get around to doing something about it. He was moved 
in the depths of his being. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept. So my, my, my question is, are we grieved about anything that we see? Are we moved by anything of the condition of the people of God? Are we moved to the point of not only compassion and going, yeah, I'll pray for you, brother, and never get into it. Are we moved to being really in our own spirit, heavy, heavy laden about that condition? He sat down and wept. Have you ever gotten news that just shocked you so much? I'll tell you the true story. Deb was diagnosed, well, first suspected of cancer in February of 2011. Between when she was suspected of having that and when we got to Dana-Farber were a period of weeks. And when we got to Dana-Farber, the first thing they did was they had to take all kinds of, you know, the battery of tests, the biopsies, and they do all the scans, and they do all that kind of stuff. But somewhere between that appointment and when we went back for the results, I knew, because God had whispered into my spirit, everything was going to be all right. That's the words that I had. Everything's going to be all right. So I went into the doctor's appointment when they were going to give us the results with the mindset that everything's going to be all right. In my mind, that meant that there was going to be a good report. No cancer. The doctor announced, I don't even remember what words he used, but basically he announced you have cancer. Now, being the noble gentleman that I am, Deb's up on the gurney, and I'm sitting next to her, my arm around her, holding her. I'm going to be her security, I'm going to be there for her, I'm going to comfort her, I'm going to make her feel safe through this. The doctor announces the result, and I'm sitting on the gurney, and I'm almost passing out while I sit there. I literally have to get down off the gurney, sit in the chair where I can put my feet on the floor and lay my head right in my lap to get the blood to rush back to my head because that wasn't the result that I had. And it overwhelmed me to hear the news. So I'm, I'm in the chair, I get my head down, I feel okay, I'm, I get back up in the gurney, I'm back there, I'm going to be her rock. Just about pass out from getting from the chair to the gurney, then I have to get back down in the chair because I was so moved by the words that were so devastating to hear that I was overwhelmed. Now, when it affects us directly, we know what it feels like to be overwhelmed. But Nehemiah's sense of things wasn't that only which affected him. See, we've got this mindset in America where it really is all about us. And it really isn't. Things affect us, but do, do others' plights affect us at all? Do the things of God affect us, or do we just obliviously live? Because I'm trying to think of the last time that I would say that hearing the news of another church's condition caused me to sit down and weep. See, Nehemiah hears news concerning the people of God in distress and reproach, the walls of the city broken down and its gates burned with fire. He sat down and he wept. He was touched deeply. And it was through that sitting down and weeping that he mourned for many days. Now, I wonder how many, many days is. I gotta think about this. Because in America, when you lose a loved one, you get three days to get over and get back on with life. Back to work, back to doing everything you're supposed to do. It doesn't sound like many days to me. I'm thinking Nehemiah sat for a while. But did you ever notice that in sometimes when you're able to be in that place of being moved, that when you're sitting and as he's doing fasting and praying, that that's when God can kind of start to mold you and shape you. In that period, of being moved in his innermost being, God gave him a compelling vision that he was going to bring forth. But he had to hear it from God. 
and receive it from God. The next apostolic principle is this. Because you get this compelling vision somewhere between verse 4 and 5, that's what we know, you know, somewhere in there. It doesn't tell us that, but before he went forward, he prayed his vision through. Before he went forward, he prayed his vision through. Sometimes it's not that we don't get a vision from God. We get a vision from God all right, and then we just charge ahead and gotta get it done. Then we try to run into things. You ever been frustrated in that in your own life where you're just kind of really new, but you run smack headlong right into a wall? First of all, that hurts. Nobody likes running headlong into a wall. If you've never physically done it, I would not encourage it. I've had to the occasion through sports especially to literally do this and I've had it spiritually on many other occasions. I don't encourage that either. But he prayed through the vision before he went about implementing it. That's a real good principle for us to, to carry out individually as well as as a church. To pray through before implementing. Because you can do the right thing in the wrong way, and it's going to be wrong. He needed to hear from God, and we'll look at how we know that, because he implores God twice, please hear my prayer. He asked God twice. The next thing, after praying, is he started to strategically gather people. And we're going to see that in verse 11 when we get through there. He gathered all the human resources he needed based on the relationships that he had. He was the king's cupbearer. Well, God didn't put him there as the king's cupbearer for no good reason. He has a purpose now. And that place of being so strategically close to the king is going to serve his benefit in the rest of the book. You'll see that if you go on and read any of Nehemiah on your own. So he first assessed the true condition, then he was moved inwardly, and as he was moved inwardly, he received that vision because he sat and he wept and mourned and fasted and prayed. And as he prayed and got that vision, then he didn't just go and do it. Because here's what we did. Well, I fasted and I mourned and I weeped and, and I, you know, and, and so now I prayed and I got the vision, so I should go and do that thing. The, the next thing is to pray about that which you've received in the vision. How do I do it? Here's the vision, rebuild the walls, but aha, what am I supposed to do? And then he gathered all his resources to carry it out. Because you know what? The truth of the matter is, he couldn't do it alone. Doesn't matter that he heard from God. Doesn't matter that God gave him vision. Doesn't matter that he prayed through that vision if he's going to have to do it alone. He needs others to do it as well. And that apostolic sense of leadership includes getting others to buy in and to get on board. Now, let's look at the contents specifically of the great prayer that we read in verses 5 through 11. Nehemiah starts off with this he says, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant in mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. Jesus says it more simply, but he said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The first thing Nehemiah does is he acknowledges God, his greatness, and his character. God is awesome and great. He keeps his covenant and his mercy with those who love him and observe his commandments. He's just acknowledging who God is. He doesn't first come to God and say, God, I need, or I want. He starts with, God, you are great and awesome. God, you're faithful to keep your covenant and your mercy. He starts with addressing the God of heaven for who he is. And that's wisdom. There's not only like a right order, but think about it. He's paying homage to the one he's going to ask favor from. I mean, that's just common sense, isn't it? 
I mean, that's just, it makes, it, it makes even, like, how we would relate to each other. You don't come up to each other and just say, hey, listen, loser, I need you to do something for me. Or you don't come up, or at least this is the way I was raised, you don't just come up and say, do this for me. At, at the very least, you ought to say, please. But if there's a position of authority, it's like, as a child, I was always raised, Mr. or Mrs., you know? I mean, there's always, you're paying homage to. Someone who's in authority over you. Um, you know? You have to, what's that? Honoring. You're honoring them. Oh God! Great and awesome. You who keep your covenant and your mercy. God, you're faithful. You're faithful. So just when you start to pray, start to pray this way. Acknowledge God, His greatness, His character, who He is, His attributes. Start with praising Him. That's what makes prayer great. Start with acknowledging who God is. The next thing He does is He doesn't say, Oh God, you're so great, I need you to do this for me. See, we still want to get to what we want to get to because it's our need or our want. He says, oh God, you who are so great, please, always a good word, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open, that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now. He's imploring God to hear him. Father, please, listen. I can say it with my puppy, but he can't talk, because I always say Woody's just like my son was. My son was so darn cute, he could get away with just about anything when he was a kid. Unless he didn't say please, because then I wasn't gonna hang, I wasn't gonna stand for it. Just wasn't gonna stand for it. I wanted him to ask in the right manner, if you will. Please. That your ears be attentive and your eyes open to the prayer I pray this day. God's concerned about a great many things in His creation. He's concerned about a great many things, including your needs and your desires when they align with His. But do we just take that for granted? God, give me. Or do we ask him in the right manner? God, please, hear my prayer. God, please, take notice of what's going on in my life. It's a vast universe out there, and I'm not saying that God can't see your thing, but there's just a lot that's clamoring for his attention. And if, if it's true, what it says elsewhere in Scripture, in Chronicles, that if the eyes of the Lord are searching to and fro throughout all the earth, the one whose hearts will be devoted to him, he's looking everywhere. I think he might stop by here when someone says, Lord, great and awesome are you. Please hear my prayer. I think that's going to gather his attention, don't you? I think so. I might be wrong, maybe my theology is in what you've been taught, but I think that this, this is a way to do it. This works. Because his eyes are searching. And he goes on and he says, oh, I, I skipped one part of that before I go on to this next thing. He says, Lord, let your eyes be open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray now before you day and night. That right there, Coupled with the New Testament, pray without ceasing. If you're praying day and night, tell me when you're stopped. Right? We should not just be flippant about our prayers, especially the things that move our heart. You know, the burden of intercession is such that when something moves your heart, you can't just be rid of it. Nehemiah was moved, and because he was moved and the work hadn't even begun yet, never mind been completed, he's praying day and night for this thing. Have you ever wanted something so bad that you just couldn't get it out of your mind and it disturbed even your sleep? That's, that's probably not a bad thing. That's probably a call to get you on your knees or on your face before God and say, God, you are great. 
Let your ears be open and your eyes, I mean your ears be attentive and your eyes be open to the prayer I've been praying. Peace comes, I believe, that when we're disturbed enough to be even awoken from our sleep, that if we'll take the time to approach the throne, I believe at that time even the peace of God will come to us. Because we worry about many things and those things occupy our mind and we don't let them go. But if we approach God and say, God, would you hear my prayer? That I'm praying without ceasing, or as Nehemiah said, a day and night. And what he starts off with is still, but what I want you to notice is he's still not asking for anything other than God's attention. And when he's got God's attention, he doesn't say, I want or I need. Because as soon as we get God's attention, that's what we do. You know? My kids come up and say, Daddy, can I have a cookie? As soon as they've got my attention, they're off. They, you know, but that's not it. Nehemiah doesn't just go, I want you, I need. What he starts with next is he goes, for the prayer that I pray before you now day and night for the children of Israel and your servants and confess the sins of the children of Israel which we've sinned against you. But he doesn't only say they sin, he said we sin. He goes, both me and my father's house. Acknowledging that we are sinners before a holy God is always a good and right thing. And ought to be part of our prayer life. That's what makes you pray. Have you ever heard of the ACTS model of prayer, A-C-T-S? Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and then supplication. Notice where supplication lies. It's at the end. Adoration first. This, this prayer right here fills the adoration, the confession, the thanksgiving, and the supplication model. So you start with the adoration, Nehemiah did that. You start with the confession, that's where he's at right now. He appeals to God's word, and he appeals to God's word in such a way, oh, no, see, I scooped, skidded it ahead on my thing again. He confessed his sin, the sin of his father, his father's house, and corporately the sins of all of Israel. You know how we are. If those people would just change, everything would be all right. We don't like to identify with other people's sins. Can I tell you that Nehemiah is not the only place, as a matter of fact, it's one of many places that this is how people pray. When Isaiah had the vision of God, he said, woe am I, for I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. He owned his stuff, and he, he associated with everybody's stuff, just like Nehemiah is doing. So if we're praying for our family, we're praying for our church, if we're praying for the kingdom of God, we might want to take some personal responsibility and identify with the whole of whatever organization, instrument, or body, if you want to use that word, that we're praying for. Father, forgive us, not them. For I have sinned and we've all sinned. And Lord, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And Lord, we've all disappointed you. And Lord, we're all in a place where we shouldn't be. And Lord, we want to get there. So he confesses both his personal and also identifies with the corporate nature of sin that has caused this very thing to happen. It's because of those things that the people are in distress and in reproach and that the walls have been broken down and the gates burned with fire. Why? Because they didn't listen to God in the first place. It's because of that that they're in the place that they're at. But in order to go forward, you confess that, receive God's forgiveness, and you move into this new thing that God has. Forgive us, Father, for not being the people that we've supposed to have been. Forgive us for sinning against you. And then he, call, he, he still isn't finished yet. Because he's still not asking yet for anything. He says, we've acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments and statutes nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Now he says, remember I pray the word you commanded your servant Moses. So he's speaking back to God the very word of God itself. That's always a great way to pray. When you don't know how else to pray, start praying the word of God back to God and say, God, in your word you said, hey, God is not a man that he should lie. He's got to be faithful to his word, amen? amen. 
So you pray the word back. Because here's one thing you can be sure of. When you pray the word of God back to God, it's not selfish. It's what he said. Because sometimes our own motives and our own desires are all about us. And we're fleshly and carnal and we want what we want and the way we want it. And, and so we ask with wrong motives. All these things are in the scripture. you know. But if you pray the word of God back to God and say, God, you said. God's going to do the things he said he's going to do because he's not a man that he should lie. He is faithful and true. He's the yes and the amen. And not even one of his words will pass away without having been accomplished. Not even one. So hence, if you notice in your radio Bible class handout, the subtitle on the Let's Pray is Talking to God with the Words of the Bible. See how good God is? I mean, I didn't go searching for this. A piece of mail came in quite a while ago. They said, hey, would you be interested to receive this little, you know, pamphlet here? Let's pray, talking to God with the words of the Bible. This is what I said to myself. Well, that's always handy to have around. This is before I knew I was going to preach on this, this the whole theme of great prayers of the Bible. But as I started to put that together and remember that this had come in just somewhat recently, I said, this is the perfect Sunday for this to happen. Praying back to God the words of God is always going to make that a great prayer. Always is it going to make that a great prayer. Because God said, he said, remember the words that you said to Moses. If you are unfaithful, I'll scatter you among the nations. Well, that's not the end of it. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. He's saying to God, God, you said that if we'll return to you, you'll bring us back to this place. If we'll return to you, you'll bring us back to this place. Here's what I love to acknowledge about that kind of a prayer. We make the appeal to God, the results are up to Him. You pray back the word of God to God, that's on Him. All you've done is say to God, God, you said, and let God prove Himself to be faithful and true. Let him prove himself. You know how we are. We want to make something happen, right? Especially guys that say, guys, we want to fix things. That's our tendency. Women I don't have for you because I've just not really ever studied that. I don't know. But women are relational is what I've been told. So you want to make sure everyone get it. Can't we all just get along? As Dan reminded me a couple weeks ago, that didn't end up so well. But the idea is that's what women want. They're concerned about the relationship. Guys, we want to make things right. But here's what the thing is. When you're talking about the things of God and the things of the kingdom, the results aren't up to us at all. It's up to Him. It's up to Him. So we ought to put it back to Him. God, you said, and let Him do instead of us get in the way. I'll go to a separate story and then come right back to this. God said to Abraham and Sarah, they were Abram and Sarai at the time, <coughs> I'll make you the father of many nations. They went, yeah, that's funny. Whatever, God. They said, no, I'm serious. And they're like, don't you know how old you are? <laughs> She's barren. The wound's closed up. This is impossible. God said, I'll do it. They went, all right. Well, a little time went by, and it hadn't happened yet. And they said, let's help God do the thing he said he'll do. Abram, have you considered my handmaiden, Hagar? And Abram went, well, to be honest with you, I've been looking at her for a long time, but I was afraid to tell her. It's kind of cute. You know he thought that because he did it. He went and he slept with the handmaiden. Stupid. We do that all the time. We think it's up to us to make it happen, and it's not. It's not up to us. It's up to God. If we're rightly aligning ourselves with what God said. God said, I'll make you the father of nations. Sarah said, you need to become a father, Abram. Why don't you go sleep with Hagar? See how that doesn't work? They, they think the outcome's going to be the same. They'll have a child. It'll be the same thing. But it wasn't the child of the promise. When God said later to Abram, take your only son, the son whom I have given you, did he forget Ishmael? Did God think that Ishmael didn't exist? Was he like blind to the reality? No. But Ishmael wasn't the son of the promise, and he wasn't the son that God had given him. 
Isaac was. We got to like that. We like to help God achieve the results that God said he'll do. Everywhere I read in the scripture where man helps God, spies go see what the land looks like. We were just talking about this this morning in Sunday school. The spies come back, 10 go, we can't do it. God said, I've given you the land, 10 go back, no, we can't do it. Well, that's the point. God said, I've given it to you. The minority report of two came back and said, God's given us the land. Well, what do you think they did? Because Israel was, you know, God's people, they took a vote. The majority won. The majority was wrong. God had given them the land. But in their natural thinking, they went, the, gi the giants are there. They've got huge weapons. The walls are built up. And oh, by the way, they're hungry to fight. Let's not do the thing that God said he would do. Let's not do the thing God said he would do. Abraham and Sarah said, let's help God do the thing he said he would do. And the, the spies came back and said, let's not do it. They were stupid too. Because they didn't believe God and they didn't take him at his word. So Nehemiah takes God at his word and says, God, you said. And he left the results up to God. He reminds them, God, that these are his people. I love verse 10. He said, you'll bring them back to the place that you've chosen as a dwelling for your name. Well, Jerusalem was the place that God had chosen. The holy city. He then goes on to say, now these are your servants and your people. You know how we think of those people, right? Them. Nehemiah doesn't say those people. He says these are your people. God, you love them. Bring them back to this place. God, you have a destiny for them. Bring them back to this place. Those people. These are your servants and your people who, God, you redeemed them. Basically, you're saying, God, don't waste your redemption. Don't let it be for nothing. Don't let it be for, for not. You redeemed them. And God, you, you didn't redeem them weakly so that in his instance, he said you redeemed them by your great power and by your strong hand. God, keep these people that you won. You Did you know that God can do a better job than we can anyway? 
I mean, just really. He's a better judge. As a matter of fact, the way I read the scriptures, he's the only judge. He's a better transformer of the heart. As a matter of fact, I read that only he can change a heart. We can't change a heart at all. He's reminding God, God, you do something with your people. They belong to you. You redeem them by your great power and by your strong hand. Finally, he again implores God. He says, God, oh Lord, I pray that your ears be attentive to the prayer of your servants and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. Let your servant prosper this day. There it is. That's the one thing that he says about himself. Let your servant prosper. Grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cupbearer. So he's, a, he, he's got this plan. He's formulated the plan. He knows that the king's going to be a part of it. He's going to have to ask for a letter from the king. Gather the people. Gather the supplies. Start rebuilding. He's going to need that. He said, so let me just find mercy before the king. I pray, oh God, that you prosper the work I'm about to do. You grant me mercy in the sight of those who I'm going to need to draw from. Well, that sounds selfish, doesn't it? Not really. You know why? He wants to prosper for the sake of God and for the sake of God's people and for the sake of God's place. He wants to prosper for the sake of God, for the sake of God's people, and for the sake of the place. It's not about him. It's about God's sake. We get so selfishly motivated in our prayers that James says you have not because you ask not, and when you ask, you ask amiss. We get so selfishly motivated that we ask amiss that we nothing. But Nehemiah's concern is not for himself. It's for God, for God's people, and for God's place. That's a great prayer. Let's be a people who pray great prayers of faith. Imploring God. I love how he closes just as he opens. Oh Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. Church, if we can pray like that, we can see God do anything and everything that he has promised. So let's pray together, get ready to close our time, and ask God in our closing hymn to revive us again. Gracious and Heavenly Father, we have so much to learn about prayer from your word, from all those who have prayed before us. Father, I just ask that you'd help us to pray great prayers of faith, prayers that change the world. We know that Nehemiah had success even in the face of obstacle and resistance and ridicule and mocking and rebuilding the walls of your place so that your people were sheltered and able to live in community together in such a way that they would bring honor and glory to you. Father, help us to be a people who desire to dwell in such a place as this, that we live together in community, sheltered by the walls of Christ, that we would bring honor and glory to you. Father, we ask that you and you alone would receive all the honor, the glory, the power, the might, the majesty, and the dominion that's due your name, for we ask it through Christ our Lord. Amen.